Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 안녕하세요. Uh, my name is John Park. I represent A41, uh, which is a validated company based in Seoul, South Korea. And I would like to actually present you uh, Obel Colin Myers, who is the CEO of Obel, um, and he's uh, his brilliant idea behind like uh, DVT technology and how he's trying to bring this idea to real life. Uh, Colin, would you like to introduce yourself to uh, the Korean public? Hey everyone, uh, thank you for having us. Super excited to be here. Uh, this is my first time in South Korea actually since before COVID. Uh, yeah, so super excited to get here and eat some good food. Thanks for having us. So uh, it reminds me of the time when we first talked about the, uh, the idea of secret shared validator a couple of years ago. And it, it's also very uh, enlightening that we're actually on stage together to talk about this idea. Um, could you actually uh, explain to the, I mean, also easy kind of mentioned about it in the last session as well, it's the same, laying the grain, uh, groundwork for us, but uh, could you actually define what distributed validator technology is to the Korean public and the audience here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the easiest way to explain this is uh, distributed validator technology enables you to run an Ethereum validator across multiple machines. Uh, today, that's not possible. Uh, today, the only way to run an Ethereum validator is on an individual machine. Uh, and uh, over the course of the talk, we'll kind of layer into these different facts. But yeah, most simply, it enables you to run it across multiple machines, which you can do a variety of different things with. So um, with, with DVT being implemented in real life, what would, what would, be the, what would, be, what would it look like in terms of like, you know, what, what differences would people actually notify when they're staking or like from a, it could be like delve into like in a few other areas, like from, from few angles, like from node operator's perspective or from a staker's perspective as well. Like, could you actually share? Yeah, so the technology itself is meant to be implemented as a primitive and meant to be used as a building block. Um, liquid staking pools, as a relevant example, are the most futuristic use case for the use of DVT today. Uh, however, it also has implications for at-home validators, centralized validators, uh, DeFi applications, and even today, DVT is relevant for some of these liquid staking token-backed stablecoins and some of these new products hitting the market. So, um, yeah, in that sense, it is a true building block. Um, happy to expand a little bit on some other parts of how it can help liquid staking pools, not mentioned in the previous chat, and also discuss maybe a couple of other use cases uh, for different users. However, from where I sit, a lot of the early adoption of DVT was focused on uptime, uh, essentially downtime prevention. However, now where we are at with the technology and the primitive is it's now being used for more futuristic use cases, uh, which put its cryptography uh, to the highest test. Uh, and at the end of the day, DVT is really an applied cryptography project uh, that's being turned into software. So a more specific example as to how it helps LSPs in that regard is uh, today in liquid staking pools, uh, all liquid staking pools, no matter what it is or the size of it or the brand of it, if there are multiple validators that are a part of that protocol, uh, each and every one of those individual validators are responsible for the machines and the private keys that the algorithm sorts the stake that ends up with them. Uh, today, in some of the larger staking pools, there are operator validators with between 100 to $500 million of value sitting on their own personal machines. Uh, today, there is nothing preventing validators in that context from shutting off their machines, uh, going haywire, or potentially trying to be Byzantine uh, in some nature. Uh, today, all liquid staking pools use social economics and or social punishment or being voted out uh, or some other type of gating system to prevent malicious or evil behavior. Uh, however, with DVT, uh, if all of those validators are sharing the same key set, then not any one of them can act malicious or sabotage or self-slash or exhibit downtime towards the pool. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's pushing the DVT primitive more towards its Byzantine behaviors, uh, which has been very quite interesting for us to see. It's today our primary go-to-market uh, and where you'll see DVT utilized in its largest scale on mainnet first. Today we are on mainnet, but not in the thousands of validator scale. 
uh, the first place everyone will see DVT utilized at that scale uh, will be in liquid staking pools. Um, in addition to liquid staking pools, there, there are other benefits. Uh, on the institutional front, I will also touch on a little bit later, we'll dive into it deeper, but there's also benefit for your centralized validator. Uh, this is your STAS business, your, your traditional staking as a service, uh, kind of the backbone of the industry, what was built over the past four years, and the company and enterprise type that provides all the infrastructure for Lido. Uh, for, for these providers, it's actually proved to be very, very beneficial in the cost saving element. Uh, it has enabled all of these different validator entities to uh, decrease the cost of their machine setup while increasing the security. This has been super important for helping these SaaS products scale, uh, as most of them are, were early to the market but are now being heavily competed against by liquid staking pools and, and having, honestly, the majority of market share is kind of coming out of SaaS and it is going into pools. And to stay competitive, DVT has been a way to help them decrease their cost. In addition to that, it has helped them substantially with their insurance topic, uh, which is another area later in the chat that we'll dig into. Yeah, and uh, I kind of briefly want to touch upon uh, how DVT could actually bring some regional diversification as well. Um, I think we could, we could actually touch upon the idea of cluster together. Um, and yeah. for cluster, like, you know, I think there are various types of clusters uh, that you can definitely like, do more explanation about it. And at the same time, give some illustration to the audience about how like, you know, we can hypothetically form like, a multi-cluster together like, you know, throughout the region and how it, would, how it would actually help out the regional diversification or diversification of nodes, um, which will help or contribute to the decentralization of ETH and, and many other networks that will be able to adopt DVT in the future, and Opal. Yeah, happy to spend a couple of minutes on geographical uh, requirements and their importance. So uh, today the Opal core team is 28 people spread across 14 countries. Uh, we have teammates from San Francisco to India, uh, and as a result of that, we've been fortunate enough to push the limits of this technology just within our own core team all across the world. Uh, so the, the, the first two validators that we put on mainnet were entirely run out of people's houses and also multi-continent and multi-country. Uh, the first example we did is we had two key shares in Ireland, one key share in Estonia, and another key share in Canada. Uh, that was the first distributed validator that we had put on mainnet. Uh, and that was a way to, so the reason that we chose the countries that we did there to be more specific is the one key share that is in Western Ireland uh, traditionally is an at-home validator like location and uh, it has very poor internet. Uh, and, and the person that normally lives there actually usually runs an at-home validator uh, and said, look, I, I actually think with me traveling so much that this isn't gonna work. Uh, so if we do one on mainnet as Obel, we're gonna have to share it amongst people in different countries. So as Izzy alluded to earlier as well, not everyone has real internet. And this has been a huge learning lesson for me is we're now running distributed validators in South Korea, we're running distributed validators uh, in Australia and New Zealand and India and you know, most places that I thought had fine internet to run an at-home validator, but actually they don't. Um, so that, that's been a very interesting uh, geographical redundancy element to study and find out which is the reality of it is internet's not even that great for there to be a whole world of at-home validators. So having technology that enables fault tolerance is actually literally the only way that we'll be able to scale this network uh, in that regard. Um, right now on the growth effort for Obel and our adoption cycle, uh, next year we will be focused most on localization in global areas that we have found high adoption over the past two years. Uh, right now, South America has been very, very interesting for us. Last year, the Ethereum Foundation had DevCon uh, in Bogota, uh, and then prior to that did a road to DevCon all through South America, and we've now like tapped into that community of people who learned and then were onboarded into the Ethereum space. And there's lots of node companies, node runners, projects, middle markets, small tier validators, uh, all coming out of South America. So uh, we find that as a new area for like growth and hope for the global validator community. Uh, and that's now how we're focusing our globalization efforts with, with Obel is where is the validator count low 
on mainnet, uh, why is it low, how can we help, uh, and then ultimately pushing and promoting people to use distributed validators in a geolocation-based way. Uh, you know, you can use it, you can run them all, the key shares in the cloud, if you want, through Amazon, AWS, you know, you can also do that. Um, or you can divide your validator up amongst four people and four continents, and you can see what you get. And that's the type of testing we've been doing on mainnet today ourselves and also in the testing efforts that we've been doing with Lido is like really pushing that geolocation to the max and checking latency and saying the added benefits of latency, do they, are they too worse than rewards? So I guess what I'm trying to say there is a distributed validator in multiple geolocations increases latency. Latency in an Ethereum validator normally means that you get less but are there ways to rationalize security versus latency? Uh, and that's really what we're testing for now for geolocation. Adding, adding a little bit more, um, I think there are two types of uh, clusters as well, solo and uh, multi-clusters. And um, not just uh, like you know, regional diversity that will be added, but I think there should be a lot of other benefits or of running, or there should be like a reason why uh, like people would do solo cluster and multi cluster as well. What are the perks of the two? And uh, I think there will be a lot of uh, potential node operators here or people who are interested in becoming an at home validator as well. So, w like, w who are ideal types for each group and cohort? I think people will be interested in, in hearing that. Yeah, so um, today there's a lot of ETH staking products, and at the beginning of this, there were not. Um, and as a background, I, I used to work at Consensus for a long time, and I used to work with the EF quite heavily on the initial adoption of the ETH2 spec and the Genesis event. Um, so so we've, we've spent a whole lot of time on the adoption of the different user types and, and making sure that there are different user types. Um, and to, today, what's most interesting is uh, by design, it's worked out now that we're three years into it. There are a lot of different validator types, and each validator type has their own wants and needs, and that has resulted in multiple different products. Uh, and the best example would be kind of like to the question that Victor asked earlier about, you know, Lido versus Alluvial. Uh, the way I look at the two things is, is they, they have different user types. Uh, so they're kind of fundamentally different products at, at, at that end. So what we found is that the more product types and the more different type of staking products that are developed, the more different use cases we find for DVT. So liquid staking pools are a multi-operator setting, so they're only using shared clusters. Uh, and they enjoy using shared clusters because it increases uh, the amount of Byzantine fault tolerance that you have, so it decreases that risk. Uh, as a centralized solo cluster person, uh, there's a lot of benefits for, for me. Um, one of them actually comes through security credentials and SOC 1 and SOC 2 compliance. Um, I'm, I'm able to never have a full private key that could be stolen or that can go rogue or, or that can be tampered with. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons for credentialing um, that like some of the larger validators are using it and again for insurance costs. Um, there's also a, a very interesting thing that we've now seen as the Obel community, which is um, a variety of small to medium-sized validator entities are now spending a lot of time testing Obel as a means to help credentialize them in other ecosystems, uh, which I thought has been pretty interesting to observe. And from where we sit on that topic, which is a new one for us, is uh, the majority of the large liquid staking pools have funded uh, efforts with external researchers and external parties to figure out how to objectively uh, decentralize the validator set. And I, I got news for you, it's a super hard problem. And we've realized that we can participate inside of that as Obel by enabling people who go through our testing experiences, our documentation, and our community to help credential them so that liquid staking pools have a neutral way to say, like, this validator is experienced, not just because this validator ran in a Lido sponsored testnet or a stakewise sponsored testnet, right? Or any of the other liquid staking pools. So we are, it's helped us build our credible neutrality as a protocol. Um, we as Obel want to be used by everyone. You can think of us as a layer two in that regard. Uh, we're not here for any one specific user group. We're more or less right now on a journey helping each and every new user group as they get created that are focused on building staking products. Indeed, I can testify as a small to mid-sized validator who was growing at the time when we first started like joining Obol, 
I think it really helped out in terms of us getting recognized by all the other node operators who are on the, on the OBL together. And at the same time, like, you know, when we were entering other ecosystem, it always helped out too. Like uh, Lido OBL testnet pilot operator was actually a very joyful experience because we had a lot of conversation with other operators. Uh, but at the same time, through that, we could actually build a reputation as well. And I think like for any potential like, you know, builders who are trying to like, you know, jump into the node operator market could actually think that way. Um, and 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 uh, jump into Obol like ecosystem as well and community as well. Uh, next, I want to kind of like you know uh, touch upon the the, uh, the 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 like the roadmap of Obol because uh, it started out. So when when it first started out, it was just a paper, right? The idea that Vitalik was actually throwing out uh, under the, uh, the the term called secret shared validator, and now like you know it's it has upgrade it itself to distributed validator technology. And Obol is one of, the, one of the projects that is actually spearheading this effort and a lot of the node operators in the ETH ecosystem knows about uh, the, the Obol. And what's the roadmap that uh, you have in mind for uh, Obol and is way ahead in terms of 2024? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, today, Obol is on its roadmap to V1. And I'd say we're about 80% there. Uh, we suspect to enter V1 territory sometime early at the beginning of next year. Uh, and our V1 journey so far has been about two years. However, DVT as a topic has been being researched and thought about and progressed for nearly four. Uh, and it has taken us this long to get to V1. Uh, however, I'm confident that our V2, V3 innovation cycles will be a bit more Moore's Law based and will be a bit quicker. Um, so, so today we have two parallel work streams going on inside of Obol, one of which is the V1 effort. Uh, this includes a collection of validators that are already on mainnet. It actually includes more than 40 entities that are participating in mainnet in some sort of shared cluster state. Uh, and that's kind of where we'll go to market is with the V1. And that's how people will start using and interacting with Obol at scale is, is with a more mature V1. A couple of items on the to-do list before we get there is really just auditing and hardening. Uh, there's not a whole lot of feature requests or anything in the roadmap that is too complex or too difficult to build. Pretty straightforward. However, over the past six months, we have begun to expand our research work streams and focus on more of what we're calling Obol V2. And everyone can think of that as ZK DVT. Uh, yes, we are throwing the ZK on top of the DVT um, because it should, uh, not because it's cool, but there's a variety of very cool tail end research problems, uh, a specific problem called proof of participation, uh, which is basically what happens in a shared validator cluster when someone is being lazy. Uh, how can you punish them or even objectively understand what their behavior is? Uh, and that involves some very difficult cryptography and, and is more of an industry problem. It's essentially a cryptographic problem where it's uh, difficult to objectively identify in a threshold signature setup who is responsible for what. Uh, so we have partnered with Nethermind for that effort and we have also incentivized Nethermind to become kind of a core development team for the Obel network, uh, which takes us to uh, the end state of our V2 vision, which is multi-client. So. Um, I've spent a lot of time at like the core protocol layer with the foundation, and I am a big proponent of the multi-client model. I, I believe it is Ethereum's probably greatest pillar to success and ability to stay credibly neutral is the multi-client model. So for V2, our, our main goal is to launch multi-client, improve the level of cryptography that's associated with a specific cluster uh, to, to make it more provable. Uh, which is very important in today's world, making things provable. And then ultimately, we we're already have begun to focus as well on what's called an Obol V3. Uh, there's no formal uh, effort really put together here, but Obol V3 is when this becomes a network. Uh, and inside of what becomes a network today, what we're most valuable for is people building staking products come to us and say, who are the validators? And a year and a half ago, that was pretty easy because there was only like 25 validator entities. Uh, today, I think we're probably getting somewhere near 100 or so. Uh, and it's been proven uh, with the community and our users that uh, we're a helpful filter of sorts. Um, and then now we're kind of starting to see very organically at the community level 
the V3 come together, uh, which is really more of a coordination-based effort where people plug directly into Obol to build on top of. Uh, and that's when we can become most like a layer two in people's eyes, is once we push forward with more of a network model, which is currently V3. Thank you. Um, and I didn't know you had V3 coming, but <laughs> I was only thinking of V2. Are you, uh, just briefly, like, you know, before we go into the next question, are you open to, so I, I know that Nethermind is working on V2 together with Obel team, but are you open to actually, like, opening up a research or grant towards the community for the V2, like, you know, ZK area, that uh, research that you, you want to do? Yeah, it's a great question as well. Um, we have started to roll out more formal working groups. One of the things that Obel is very lucky to have is you know, we're not short on smart people who want to help. And it's taken about two years to mature the project to a coordination level and tooling level where we can actually go out and work with you know, people like Dan Bonet from Stanford to help progress V2, right? And we can actually begin to include some of the smartest people in the world who have raised their hand and said, this is a huge problem, we want to help with that. And now it's up to us to facilitate that and make sure that the smartest minds come together. So we've been working in small working groups that are not necessarily very formalized or public. And now as the protocol matures, we are moving things over to the community more. And it's uh, really because we're fortunate to have one, uh, like a very strong group of people who are willing to help out that we don't have to incentivize. So, you know, Obel doesn't have a token. We're not a token project, so I'm sure some people can imagine it's quite difficult to incentivize certain behavior. Um, but really what happens from my experience in this is the only people that end up working with you are people who actually care or that can help. Uh, and if you're designing from that basis, then it's actually the best type of community help to get. Uh, however, you know, we are fortunate in that regard. Not every project is able to get very smart people to help without uh, having to incentivize them in, in you know, a certain way. True, true, touche. Um, as, a, as a node operator, uh, when, when I look at Obel, uh, we've been participating starting from the early stage, early, early phases. And now um, we're one of the solo clusters on mainnet alpha as well. The experience so far has been, has been great. But as a node operator, I think there are like, you know, clear incentives to actually pay attention to Obel. But what do you think? Um, uh, why, why do you think that investors, institutional investors even, have to like, pay attention to DVT and Obol, like, in a sense, like, you know, what would actually benefit them to, uh, to in terms of like, you know, paying attention to Obol, and what do they get out of it? Great question as well. So if you believe in Ethereum, then you have to believe in Obol. It's just really the only thing. Um, DVT as a primitive was also designed and created by the foundation uh, and kind of released to the community and has been specified in a certain way to enable it to grow and to flourish. Um, so the way that we look at this is quite simple, which is if, if you believe in Ethereum and you want the network to succeed, then you have to want DVT to be adopted because it enables more machines to come online, it prevents single operator failure, it decreases risk, it increases the security of everyone's setup, it increases the credibility of the Ethereum network. Um, so, you know, if you're not long ETH, then you're probably not long Obol, but if you believe in Ethereum, then you should definitely believe in DVT. Yeah, and uh, I think institutional investors would also benefit out from using, like, Obol uh, operators because they will be paying less in terms of fee because I would probably assume that operators who are running on Obol will probably have to ha will pay less in terms of insurance when it comes down to the, uh, when it comes down to like insurers like they will be asking are you like running your uh, nodes on on top of Obol or not and then they'll probably like because because as you said like you know uh, it's not just about downtime but also like you know it it just prevents a lot of the risks uh, factors that are related to the uh, node operations. And for ETH, it's actually the, the threat is real for which uh, operators you choose. So like, could you cover a little bit on, on that end? Yeah. So today, well, the way that the community has presented DVT, uh, shout out to the liquid staking pools and everyone for helping us push the narrative forward, but it has been definitely presented in a very rosy manner. 
uh, it, it seems to kind of help solve all your problems, you know, the, the end all be all, whatever it may be. Uh, but there are inherent risks with adopting new software and introducing middlewares, which is what Obel is, does also increase complexity for the user. Today, what we're most focused on in Ethereum is enabling more validators to come online. And that's not just by you know, enabling DVT to add more professionals. Uh, it also needs to add non-professionals into the network, which is very important. Um, so de-risking the network and enabling these people to, to come in is super crucial. Um, more specifically, in, inside of the insurance realm is where this comes in for the institutions. Uh, we've gotten a lot of encouragement that Obel does decrease risk which has been the big litmus test that everyone wants to see from us now is, you know, how does it decrease risk? Uh, please show us that, you know, some empirical evidence. Um, throughout all of our different testings, we've recently been trying to slash ourselves. We've been trying to figure out how it could be bad or worse performing. In, in our most recent larger enterprise testing effort, we performed within 1% of a regular validator. Uh, and at this point, we are pushing a threat model publicly to show people how Obel could be attacked and why. Uh, and most of these efforts are coming from insurers uh, to kind of round out the thought. So right now, one of the more institutionally successful things that's happened to the primitive has been an acceptance of the primitive by insurers. And now insurance providers have come to Obel and said, we would love to insure staking providers. However, uh, today with their current technical setup, mine is DVT. Uh, a bad day at the office means you could lose 32 ETH or everything, and that, that, that is the case. Today, in the most serious slashable situation, you will lose all 32 of your ETH, but it's very hard to predict due to correlated slashing and kind of all these network-based uh, things that no actuaries have, have actually really ever seen before. Um, so receiving this feedback from insurance has been very, very helpful to understanding what they, they want to see and the different adoption that we need to push forward. Um, and we're looking forward to working on the risk and what types of risk it increase and what types of risk it decrease. Uh, however, today, net-net, uh, DVT is being presented by the insurers as a discount uh, because they are currently unable to underwrite a Ethereum validator that could lose everything in one day. Yeah, I mean, for institutional investors who are trying to stake their ETH or trying to have crypto exposure and staking uh, as one of their strategy later on should definitely take into account of like, you know, when they're staking, whether the operators are using DVT or not, right? Um, and uh, just like Victor did, <laughs> I would like to do it too. Um, if like uh, the audience wants to learn more about Obel, what are the great resources for them to actually check? Is it your website or is it the forum? Like, I think there are multiple channels that you can actually share with the audience. Yeah, so best place to follow us is obel.tech. Um, the most up-to-date place through obel.tech is our doc site. Our doc site's actually linked in directly with our code base, so every time we push updates or, or anything around that realm, it, it'll go through the doc, so the, the docs are the greatest source of truth. Uh, we also have a Discord community that you can join. Uh, we also have a research forum, uh, and all of these links can be found uh, on the obel.tech website. As far as I know, Obel has uh, many Korean operators and also uh, is trying to achieve big things in Korea in the future as well. Um, so if there is any final remarks that you want to give to the Korean audience, I think this is the chance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very excited about the growth opportunity of South Korea. We would love to see the validator presence kick up here. Um, shout out to all the South Korean validators in the room and the investors that, that we have. Um, we appreciate your guys' support and super critical place to get machines online and looking forward to helping. Um, I'm here with my co-founder and also our chief growth officer. Uh, we'll be able to answer any questions that you guys have and uh, looking forward to it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, everyone. Thank